Amen. Amen. Oh, that he would open our eyes. The psalmist says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous truths from your word. 
And I pray that he would just open to us, reveal to us his goodness, his mercy, his love, and then that we would take what he reveals to us and share it with others. Amen? And we're called to do that. This past week, did you share of, share of any of God's goodness that you are a recipient of to somebody else, with somebody else? Just a thought. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, yes, we looked at some verses from Luke 22 last week. We were looking at the Lord's Supper. But today we return to our studies in Luke, Luke chapter 12. We'll be reading verses 1 through 7. And you might think, well, boy, it's been a while since we've been in Luke. And you're right, it's, it was last year since we've been in Luke. Some of you will get that a little later today. This is a, a full chapter. It really is. I mean, there's 59 verses. And, and a lot of the content that we find in Luke chapter 12 is similar to what we find in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7. And again, if you've been reading your New Testament that we gave out a couple years ago, well, that's where you had been since last Sunday, if you've been looking at that, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And uh, as we were singing that last song, I thought, praise God, you, you know, we just read that truth, if you read it yet today, uh, about the firm foundation. Jesus considers the person who hears, not only hears his word, but does them, is like the wise man who built his house upon what, church? All right, so some of you are paying attention. Yeah, that's wise. And so if that's the wise thing to do, and this is according to Jesus, the very Son of God, the wise thing is to build our house upon Him, upon hearing His Word and putting it into practice. That's the only wise thing our Creator, our Sustainer, our Savior said. So everything else would be considered what? Foolish. Okay, we're going. Ready? Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than what, church? Yeah, we're, we're, we're of more value than the birds. <laughs> the birds. Let's pray. You might think, this is for the birds. No, this is for us today. And in God's eyes, we, as already prayed, who have been made in the image and the likeness of Him, are of most importance. Father, we thank You again for time together this morning. I thank You for Your Word. Father, I pray that You would help us to understand it. There are warnings here, and there is also encouragement here. I pray, Holy Spirit of God, you're the only one that can remove the dullness of hearing. You're the only one who can soften and make receptive the hardened heart. You alone can remove the blinders and allow us to see, spiritually see, that is. And so I pray that you would do that, Father. I pray you would do that, Holy Spirit, uh, that your word... That you will take your word which is living. And you would allow your word to affect our thinking. To affect our affections. That you would minister to our entire inner being. 
that you would do business in our hearts today, dear God. That if there are those here in our midst that does not have the fear of the Lord living with them, that that would change. That you would do that miraculous work of new birth in this service. As your word goes forth, you'd bring people to saving knowledge of you, God, through faith in your son, Jesus. Help us to understand the then and there as Jesus ministered to the multitudes. Help us to properly bring it to the here and now and make the application that is intended. And Father, again, all for your glory. All that... Uh, all for the sake of Jesus' church to continue to march on for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. I ask it in our Savior's name. Amen. I don't know if you noticed this today. I noticed it when I went past the first place. Noticed it when I went past the second place this morning. And then this little analogy came to mind. But as I left our home and dropped down over the hill... And I like doing that when it's still a little bit of dark, or still a little bit dark out. And I see all the lights, well not all of them, but I see a lot of lights over Clearfield. And just often reminded that many of those lights are of homes. And those homes represent people, and those people represent eternal souls. So it's a good reminder for me to pray. To pray over Clearfield as I make my descent, if you will. Well, today as I made my descent, I noticed an empty parking lot at a car dealership. Yeah, I understand. I understand. So anyhow, I continue to pray and think and sing and I'll do all those things because i got a lot of things going on in this head at all times and maybe some of you have that same problem. Or maybe it's not a problem. But as I drove past the second place and saw the same thing, there's a dealership, everything's put away. Why? Because there's a storm coming. There's a storm coming. I mean, you get tired of hearing about the storm coming. There is things you can do about it. Stop watching the television. Quit watching the weather channel. Shut it off. I thought, you know what? That's wise. That's prudent. That's diligence. Just from a business practical standpoint, that's taking care of your inventory. That's going to take a lot more hours to go around and clean the snow off of those and shovel in between and plow and all that stuff you've got to plow anyhow. And also just safeguarding, again, your inventory. Right? That's wise. It would be foolish to make no preparations for the storm that's coming. I tried to make preparations, couldn't get the snowblower to, to start. My shoulder got sore, forget it. I'll deal with it later with a shovel. And I'll tell you, friends, there's a storm coming. And it's foolish not to be prepared for. There's no escaping the storm. You can't get a ticket to Florida and fly away from this one. And that storm is a storm of eternal judgment. Do you understand that? No one will escape it. No one. Is there a way we can look at the, at the judgment that awaits us? Is there a way to be able to look at it with assurance? and with hope, and with a, a, a peace that carries us every day until we're there? And of course the answer is absolutely yes. If you were paying just a little bit of attention in the seven verses that were read, we, we saw that we are to not fear, and then we are to fear. And so today we're looking at this matter of Jesus' instruction on falsehood and fearful. So let's, let's return to this study, and I hope that your wheels are turning up there a little bit. 
of the analogy that, yes, there's a storm coming. We may get 8 to 12 inches, whatever it is. Sometimes I think they want to scare you. I don't know. Or they're in the cahoots with the guys that sell, sell the snow blowers and stuff and whatever. So you get your snow plowing scheduled in advance or something. I, I don't know. But remember, the storm that really matters and the fear that really matters is here before us today in our text. When we read in the meantime, in the meantime what? And since it's been, it has been last year since we even looked at this, we do need to do a little catching up here. Here he goes with the catching up. In the meantime, in the meantime of what? Well, when you look back at verse 37 of Luke 11, Jesus is at a Pharisee's house. He asked him to come and eat, so Jesus comes and eats. And then Jesus reveals to him. He uncovers. Here, here's this Pharisee covering, uh, covering him, himself in this cloak of self-righteousness, and Jesus just takes away the cloak. So as he does reveal what is within this Pharisee's heart and within many of their hearts. We come down to then verse 53, and it says, And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things. Look at verse 54. Lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. Oh, you guys look so religious on the outside. But here's their heart. Here's their heart, what we see in 53 and 54. So that's in the meantime. So that brings us up to speed. This is where things are at. He was at the Pharisee's house. He, uh, he exposed their hypocrisy. They're now really mad and looking on how they can take him out. And meanwhile, he's at the peak of his ministry. I mean, we're now down to the final months of his ministry. By now, thousands have been healed. Do you realize that? Thousands. And so when we read the word, when it says, in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude, myriads, thousands, 10,000, the crowd's so big now they're trampling over each other. The popularity has grown that much. The interest to see him heal people, wanting to be healed, ones who have been healed, proclaiming what he has done. We can see how this crowd has, has come about, right? And so he's got this huge thousands and thousands around him. And he says to his disciples, you know, by verse 13, we see now the crowd coming into the conversation. When in verse 13, then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother, so, so, so. We'll get to that later, Lord willing. But for right now, he's first talking to his disciples. It would be more than just the 12. So here are followers of Jesus in the midst of this throng. And he says to them, what does he say to them? Well, when we look at verse, and this isn't going to be on the screen or on the wall. Look at verse 1. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy or hypocrisy. So here's our first warning that we see Jesus making here in our text today. He's warning them. He's warning them. And really in our text today, we see this, this matter of a warning of hypocrisy. We also see that nothing is going to be hid, that all things are going to be exposed. In our narrative today, we see that all will give an account. All will give an account. No one's going to escape that. Do you realize that? Fourthly, we see that they're called to be witnesses and to share what he has given to them. And then fifthly, we see a proper fear. Who we're not to fear and who we are. So we'll get to those as we work our way down. But first, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. What does leaven do? Leaven permeates. Leaven corrupts. Hypocrisy, deceit, dissimulation, pretense. For the most part, the Pharisees were phonies. Their whole religious deal was a sham. 
For the most part, that's how it was. I mean, when you look back, look at verse 40 or 39 of Luke 11. Uh, then the Lord said, to, now you Pharisees, you, you make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of what? Greed and wickedness. So hypocrisy is uh, pretending, a, a pretense that you're this on the outside, but when in, in reality on the inside, you're something completely different. And he challenges them on that. They were prim and proper on the outside, but inwardly they were corrupt. He said to them, you're like whitewashed tombs full of dead man's bones. Eleven, really, a metaphor, eleven was uh, mental or moral corruption. And it was viewed in its tendency to infect others. And, and so we see this concern uh, of them, of their hypocrisy, their teaching. So the hypocrisy here, the leaven of their hypocrisy is this. Their teaching, their false doctrine, as well as their lifestyles. When we think of hip hypocrisy, we mostly think of lifestyles, right? Saying one thing, living something else completely. But theirs was not only their lifestyles not matching up with what they preached and taught, but also what they taught was false. So they're hiding behind this cloak of religion. They're full of deceit. Uh, the Amplified Bible says that leaven is pervasive. It, 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 corru it has a corrupting influence. And so these Pharisees, in their teaching and in their self-righteousness, they were hypocrites. And Jesus warns about that. So you and I, when we hear that, shouldn't we be thinking, hmm? And instead of worrying about other people's names coming to mind, or they're a hypocrite, they're a hypocrite, no, 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 let's stop that. What about me? And asking the Lord, let's, let's apply real, that acronym of real. We're going to do it this month, maybe the whole year, I don't know. To remember what God's word says, remember God's goodness, and then to examine. And so God examined, am I a hypocrite in what I do? Is my life just a farce? Is my life just this persona that isn't so? Is it, is it just pretense? I mean, understand what I'm saying. And this shouldn't matter to you. It should matter to you whether you're saved or unsaved, but particularly if you are a child of God. Because how we live does matter. How we live affects other people's lives. Do you realize that? And that's why Jesus is saying beware because the way the Pharisees carried themselves, uh, this was concerning because of the pervasiveness of it all, of how, how their lifestyles could get in and permeate others and corrupt them. And so can ours. And so how we live does matter. How we live matters. And so we should be asking God, examine me. That's why I read Psalm 19. That and because it is where I was at in my Psalms today. Finished up the last half of 18, moved on to 19. And I, I do want God to examine me. Uh, I want him to keep me from presumptuous sins. I, I don't know what's going on all in this head of mine, in this, in this inner person. And that's the part of, of hypocrisy a lot of times. People are so self-deceived. Do you realize that habitual liars don't even know they're lying? And hypocrisy can work the same way, that you get caught in this lifestyle, that you, you, you're deceived yourself. You don't even see how you are. So wouldn't it make sense to be praying to God, God, examine me. God, reveal to me. I don't want to give this world any ammo, if you will, to just, there he is, just another hypocrite. This professing Christian is nothing but a hypocrite. I, I don't, there's, there, there's things that run through my mind often, and that is, I never want to bring shame to the name of God. Never. And I never want to bring pain to the family of God, the body of Christ. I don't want to bring, bring pain to my family. I don't want to bring pain to any other person's family. I don't want to bring shame to God.
But I believe a hypocrite is somebody that, that they may pretend that they're religious. They may pretend that they're holy. Or they may pretend that they're this or that. When in reality they aren't. When reality it's about self. Well Jesus warns about that. And I think I, I, I have given that enough uh, to go on. Especially since we looked at it last time when we were there in that passage. And so then he goes on to verse 2, and 2 is tied to 1. It, this is really contextual when you look at it. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, for there is. Beware of this hypocrisy because you need to understand that even though people hide under this pretense, under this cloak of righteousness, it's all going to be revealed. How many of you ever heard you can't, or you can run, but you can't hide? That's truth. How many of you ever heard you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time? Something like that. Well, when we look at verse 2, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed nor hidden that will not be known. It's liberating to not have to worry about living a life of trying to cover up your tracks. Isn't it? It is. But hypocrites don't have that, that experience of liberation. Because they are trying to hide something. They're trying to keep something undercover, concealed. That's foolish. This verse tells us it's foolish. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. When we look at verse 3, therefore whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetop. That's a little sobering, isn't it? Well, we're going to bring Matthew's account into this. By the way, Matthew chapter 10 deals with this. Mark chapter 4 does. And so if we can have our uh, first slide up there, please. If I got this right, yeah, there it is. So from Matthew's account, therefore do not fear them. And this seems to be maybe getting the cart ahead of the horse here a little bit, uh, but we'll, we'll get them caught up. Therefore do not fear them. Fear who? Well, we already read that in our text here uh, of those who can harm the body but can't harm the soul. Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be made known, that will not be known. And now here, when you look at Matthew's account and Luke's account, this is twofold. In Matthew's account, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. In other words, here's Jesus taking this saying, and if you will, in the positive what I have poured into you in privacy, I want you to be out there proclaiming it. And I don't want you to be afraid in doing so. And we'll get back to that fear in a little bit here. In Luke's account, when we have it and we look at verse 2 and 3, it's a sober reminder, and these are what theologians call the hard sayings. This is a sober reminder that we're going to give an account of everything. In fact, let me just read to you Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, 37. It won't be on the screen. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, 37. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account on it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Our words... Yeah. And just remember, Jesus alone acquits. Our acquittal comes from Jesus. He's the only one that declares us justified, not guilty. Jesus alone saves. You and I will give an account of how we lived our lives, of the words we spoke, 
Yes, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. According to Colossians chapter 2, he has already dealt with all of our sins. But we still will give an account of how we lived our lives after we've been saved. And, and the unjust, those who reject Christ, are going to give an account for their lives. We'll talk about that in here in just a little bit. And I know I've said it probably three times now, but we need to understand the weightiness of this. There's no escaping judgment. Now, if we know Christ is Lord and Savior, we pass from death onto life. Eternal life with God. But if we reject the only means of justification, the only means of salvation, then we are eternally condemned. So judgment does not need to be feared, but for even Christians, we need to consider that every word we speak, all of our actions, all of that will be brought into account. Our sins are already dealt with. It's not going to be that. But how we conducted ourselves, that will be brought into uh, a day of recounting, if you will. For the unjust punishment. For the just degrees of rewards. And we'll, again, talk about that shortly. So when we look at this, whatever I tell you, the dark speak in the light, whatever you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. When we look at uh, Luke's account, therefore whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. Whatever you have, what you have spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetop. So Jesus is taking, telling his disciples, you go proclaim. Well, you've been taught in private, you go proclaim it. And he's telling all of us, we'll give an account for our idle words, for our behaviors. We'll give an account. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Why the words? Because the word is a reflection of the heart. Right? I don't know who said it, but years ago some I heard it said that what's in the well comes up in the bucket. Right? Our words have a source, don't they? God judges a person by his words because they reveal the state of his heart. Words, as the index of the heart, however idle they may seem, will be taken account of whether good or bad in estimating character in the day of judgment. And again, this is not that we're saved by the fact that our good words outweigh our bad. No, no, salvation is always by God's grace. We're saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves, the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. It's never a matter of works or merit. However, we will give an account for the way we lived our lives. Those who have trusted Christ do not have to worry of judgment. We're not going to be eternally condemned. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, Romans 8.1. But it is sobering, is it not, to remember I will stand before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. I will stand before him and give an account. I'm saved, but I still will give an account. Consider these ver or this verse here. Let me read verse 4 to you. Only 5 is on the screen, if we can, please. Before you read verse 5, look at that, look at ver or let me read verse 4. Paul says, For I know nothing against myself, yet I'm not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. In other words, I can say I've got a clear conscience. I had somebody tell me the other day, you're too hard on yourself. I said, look. In a time of prayer, this came to me. And it has come back to me now three times. So you can say I'm too hard on myself, but I'm telling you I need to tell you this. That that wasn't smart of me. That though the story was true and funny, it did nothing to build you up and encourage you. And so as, I, as I'm brought, this is brought to my attention, I'm compelled. I need to share with you and, and confess to you. And he said, I thought it was funny. It was a funny story. And it was a true story. But it didn't give God any glory, and it surely wasn't edifying. It's sort of one of those, hmm. And so when they're, hmm, 
it's best just to forget it. Now you're all wondering. Verse 5. Therefore, so again, I can think that everything's cool here, but I'm not the judge of what's cool here. I can think that my own conscience is clear, and it is, and I confess what I have to confess, and yet Paul's saying, but that you're not the final judge of yourself. Again, just pushing this whole point that we're going to stand before God. There is a day of reckon, reckoning. There's that old saw, one tin soldier rides away. Nobody's going to ride away. Not without first standing before God. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. Until the Lord, what? What's it say? Till the Lord comes. Didn't we say in the Lord's Supper last week from, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the, this cup, you proclaim the Lord's what? Death. And death representing uh, his, his life, his death, his, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. It represents the good news of Christ. That is, as often as we eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. God will praise us. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and uh, there's a couple different passages in the New Testament. I keep thinking of 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, there's Romans chapter 14. But yes, we're going to give an account. And for those who reject Christ, the great white throne of dr judgment that we read about in Revelation 20. And, and some have different views on it. Sees, sees all there. That's okay. And again, we'll iron some of that out. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. Why in the world are we going there? Just please turn there for a moment. And if you don't want to turn there, just please listen. Because I was studying early in this week. This was a passage that came to mind. There's another one I'm going to read to you that came to mind, and I didn't put the slides because we'd have too many slides, I guess. Picture the setting. Paul's in Athens. And so here's all these smarty pants. Here's these intellects. Here's these philosophers, okay? And yet also... They're so idolatrous, and yet they're so paranoid on their worship that it, they even put this little shrine up to the unknown God. In case we missed one, I guess. That's what it says in verse 23. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, Acts 17, verse 23, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Remember, this isn't fairy tale. This isn't fictional. This happened to the Apostle Paul. It's just how crazy people are. They, they worship the works of man's hands. And so Paul uses this as a, as a great opportunity, as, as a door, as a gateway, if you will. Therefore, he, he says... Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood, Adam and Eve, one blood. Every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we do what? If you're reading along, we live and move and have our being. In other words, it's by him. He's the one who created. He's the one who sustains. We have our every breath by him. And then Paul says, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are, to, we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, 
And here it comes. Here comes the tie of to, with today's passage. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, that's Jesus. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. You know what their response was? Look at verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. I have a guy I know who, unless the Lord works in his life, he's dying. And we were talking just recently. He said he believes in God, but doesn't know really much about it. So I'm sharing with him. And then he said, that's okay, that's enough. He says, that's where things get confusing to me. I said, okay, but did you understand everything thus far? Yeah, I did. It's okay. I'll leave it at that. That talked basically about God creating us in his image, him like, in his likeness, that he created us to commune with him, that sin has separated us from God, and that Jesus, the perfect God-man, fully God, fully man, without sin, has come. And he has given his perfect life for us. All that's clear, you understand. Okay, I'll leave it at that then. And praying that God in his goodness would lead to repentance. Because as Paul says, there, there's a day, there's a day coming. The day's appointed, a day in which he will judge the world. You can't escape it. You can't. And so God in his mercy continues to call and God in his mercy continues to draw and what will you do with that calling and that drawing? Let's look at some more hard sayings here. And we have quite a few in this chapter. Next slide, please. So I bring your attention back to the text that we started with this morning. Verses 4 and 5. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after they have no fear, have no more, and after they have no more that they can do, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. So we see we're not to fear, and yet we see we are to fear. Now in this text, in this translation, the word afraid and the word fear is the same word in the Greek. And some translations just have it that way. Do not fear, do not fear. Same word. What is, what is Jesus saying here to his disciples? Because we've got these thousands of people gathered around, but remember, first he's talking to his disciples right here. And then the word's making its way out, and then the crowd starts interacting. So we have a warning in verse 1, beware of the leaven. That's a caution, beware, beware. What do you do with a beware sign? Do you scoff at it? Does it just give you a little bit more initiative just, just to go against it because it says beware? Some of you living on the edge, you do that stuff. When it says beware of the dog, guess what? I'm being aware of the dog. You might say, well, you're a wuss and you just that's how you are. Well, if the sign says beware, it's probably pretty wise to beware. I'm not going to fight authority there. I'm not going to push the limits. This is so much more weightier, though. This is dealing with eternal matters. And so not only does Jesus say beware of the hypocrisy of the, of the Pharisees, the hypocrisy, don't be afraid of that, or be aware of that, but now he's also given another warning two of them here, if you will, when he says, do not be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. I mean, what's the, least, what's the most they can do to you? Kill you. Well, that, for most would be, that's a pretty big reason to be concerned. Do we see? 
Do we see the comparison of temporal versus eternal here? And Jesus is basically saying, look, that day will come for all. The, the day of this life coming to a close. And, and so fearing those who might hasten that when God is sovereign, he's in total control anyhow, quit living in that fear. And he's also saying this uh, in advance because the days will come, and he read, and throughout the gospel we read of what awaits most of them. Most of them will lose their lives sharing the gospel. So this is somewhat of a, of a warning and, and just a heads up. This is probably what's going to happen to many of you. But I don't want you to be afraid. Because all they can do is end your earthly existence. That's it. And again, for those who only believe there's the earthly existence and that's it, that's everything, isn't it? But according to Jesus, no. No. And it's not just for the Christian who will go down through eternity. All will go down through eternity. We have a, an inner man that is eternal. And so he says, don't be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more they can do. That's all they can do. Yeah, you can snuff my life out. My mortal earthly body will... Boom, but you can't stop this inner man. You can't stop. And that's what Jesus is saying. They can't take your soul. Why would you fear somebody who can't take your soul? They can end your life, but they can't take your soul. Now, this is hard. I understand this. But the whole point is, is the fact there is a proper fear. There is a proper fear. There is a proper, proper reverence. And he has it right here in this verse. But I will show you whom you should fear. Does God want us to fear him? Yes. Yes. Let me explain this because this is difficult for a lot of people. And once we come to know Christ, according to John's epistle, perfect love casts out all fear. And how many of you in your own lives, in your own walk with God, that fear of him, like a torment fear, like, oh my, he's the one who has final say, that that fear has changed now into such a reverence and such an awe and such a love for him. That my fear is, I don't, my fear is I don't want to offend him, the one who has final say. And so, fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. In other words, he's the one that has final authority. In, in Moses' song, in Moses' song we find in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 39, Moses, God's spokesperson, is singing a song. And it says this about God. Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God besides me. Paul, in a sense, was saying that in Acts chapter 17. So Deuteronomy 32, 39. Now see that I, even, even I, am he, and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. And that's what Jesus is saying. There's no one that can deliver from God's hand. God has final say. If you don't know Christ, that ought to worry you and shake you to the core. And I pray that it does. That's why in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. They just scoff at it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's like a love for a parent and a respect for a parent as a child that, that grows, that grows. I know that God wants what is best. I know that he knows what is best. I know that he has final say. I've told this story before, and so I won't say it again, other than it hasn't been all that many years ago that, that through a storm, a literal storm, that God in his spirit says, 
Scott, you know how powerful I am. Yes. You know I hold everything in my hands. Yes. And I can do whatever. Yes. And it was one of those, you do have proper fear of me. Yes. It wasn't a looming, hold it over your head, but just a reminder, again, of this very thing. The one whom I need to be sure that I am trusting is the one who holds everything and has final say. And so once you grow in that fear, you, you start going from, from more of a terror to a reverence and an awe and a love and of appreciation for him. How many understand and have experienced that in your own walk? And maybe some are still, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't fear God. I don't fear anybody. And I would say then according to the scripture, you're a fool. Because the word of God says the fool is in his heart has said there is no God, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. For my friend, he at least said, I, no, I do believe there's a God. I do believe. Oh, that revelation would come, and an understanding, a proper healthy understanding of the fear of the Lord would come, because that's the gateway then in which we grow in the reverence and the knowledge of God. And so, and we need to roll on. You know, in Daniel chapter 2, or 12, verse 2, you can jot that down. It won't be on the screen. Daniel chapter 2, verse, or chapter 12, verse 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust, and in other words, any, uh, in other words, those who have died, who, who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. I'm only saying this because you need to understand there is everlasting life, there is everlasting death, everlasting contempt. Jesus said this himself. Next slide, please. And we're, we've got one more and we're done. Jesus says, do not marvel at this. You'd have to go back and read to get the context. But do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. You say, well, there it is, they're doing good. The doing good is entrust, entrusting one's faith, committing one's faith to Christ the God-man, who alone justifies you and I who alone acquits us, who alone, when we stand before God, we stand right with God now because of our faith in Christ. That's the good work we do is believe in, in Christ and trust Him. But I want you to see that where it says, those who have done good to the resurrection of what? What does it say? Life. And those who have done evil rejected Christ to resurrection of condemnation. There's a time when the bodies will be risen, raised up maybe, and then judgment. Judgment. What do we do with all this? Well, this, this, these verses came to mind. This is the last slide, and then I want to wrap it up by looking at verse 7 of Luke 12 one more time. Solomon did a lot of foolish things. He's the wisest man, and yet did a lot of foolish things. You know that? When you look at his life. And yet here's what he says. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. The whole matter. What whole matter? Life. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. It all boils down to this. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether what, church? Good or evil. There's no escaping that. There's no escaping that. But for the child of God, we don't have to fret. We don't have to worry. Let me read you, MacArthur. Judgment, retribution is the real equalizer, as Solomon saw it. For God will bring every act to judgment. 
Unbelievers will stand at the great white throne of judgment, Revelation 20. Believers before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 is one passage. When all is said and done, the certainty and the finality of divine retribution give life its meanings, its meaning. Whatever may be one's portion of life, accountability to God, whose ways are often mysterious, is both eternal and irrevocable. You know, some deal with it like they, like, I guess I deal, dealt with this storm that's coming. <laughs> I'll, I'll get to it when it happens. I'll deal with that later, right? How many of you ever heard the experience? It's too late, baby. It's too late. It's too late. Uh, when the flood came and God closed up the ark, guess what? It was too late. Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, their wives, wasn't too late for them. They were obedient. They heard the call. The storm warning was clear. They took it seriously. But the millions around perished because they didn't take the warning seriously. They didn't heed righteous Noah's preaching all along. Yeah. And if so, we'll deal with it later. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. No, you won't. No, when you take your last breath, there's, there's no changing anything. It's done. There's no praying them into heaven, paying them into heaven. No, no, no. There's no other chances. Last breath here, final. We need to understand that. So, we close with Luke 12, 7. He reminds them they're more, they're, that if God knows about the sparrows, and according to Matthew's account, not one of them falls to the ground without the Father knowing it. He says, you're, you're much more important than birds. Verse 7, but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more valuable. You are of more value than many sparrows. What is Jesus is saying? You have a proper fear for God. And you have nothing to fear. Do you understand? If you have a proper fear of God where you acknowledge Him as Lord and you obey Him and you stand in awe of Him and you reverence Him and not just by words but your life, you don't have anything to fear. You get the right fear right, then there's nothing left to fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. I love in verse 32 of this same chapter, it'll be another year before we get there, but do not fear, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. There's no reason to fear. If, you're, if you have fear, reverence for God, you have nothing to fear. If you don't, you have everything to fear. Let's pray. Father, thank you for time together this morning. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you will take your word and you will use it to break into hearts, break into lives. Let people exchange their fear, their fears for a reverence, a reverence and an awe and a fear of you, O oh God, through faith in Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen.
lots of times to be in that place of understanding our need for you is a blessing all starts there realizing realizing just how there isn't salvation in any other than the person of your son and and yes we can go through life rejecting you but then what Mm -hmm. then what help us to see our great need our need of forgiveness our need of salvation so that when we stand before you, we are quitted, we are counted righteous, we stand reckoned justified through Jesus. Help us to see our need for him. Help us to have a healthy fear of you, O oh God, so that we don't have to fear anything else in life. And help us to live real. Help us not to be hypocritical in our words and our actions. Help us not to be people of pretense, but people of sincerity, genuineness. Help us to be true followers of yours for your glory in Jesus' name.